Uh, before we begin, may we come together before the Lord, bow in our prayer. Lord, we thank you for this evening that we're able to come to close the Lord's day. And we thank you that it's here that we're able to come to worship you. And we ask therefore now as we come to the preaching of your word, please grant me grace and mercy that I may bring forth your word with boldness, with conviction, with clarity. And Lord, uh, that may your words take root in our hearts to encourage us that to draw us closer to yourself evermore. And for Christ's sake we pray. Amen. What is the first thing that comes to your mind whenever someone speaks about the benefits of Christ's death, his sacrifice and his death on the cross? I'm sure you have heard of people mentioning it many times to you, haven't you? So what's the first thing that comes to your mind about the benefits of Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross? I believe that many a times our minds are drawn habitually to justification. Well, we will think about the pardoning of our sins. We will think about the permanent removal of the sentence of condemnation that had hung over our heads. However, just, justification is just one of the benefits that we have received. The other being sanctification. So today, with our Lord's help, we shall dwell into Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. And ponder over the theme, the Christian duty of sanctification. The Christian duty of sanctification under three subheadings, namely, first, the basis for our sanctification. Second, the command to pursue sanctification. And third, the encouragement and help given us onto sanctification. Well, this is actually being fleshed out in Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 16, question 43, which is as follows. The question is, what further benefits do we receive from Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross? Well, the answer is, through Christ's death, our old nature is crucified put to death and buried with him, so that evil desires of the flesh no longer reigns in us, but that we may offer ourselves to him as a sacrifice of thankfulness. Hence, we shall have one eye fixed on it, on this catechism, as we make our way through today's sermon text. To better understand the basis for our sanctification, we begin by looking through a few questions and extract the answers from the text itself. So question one, we can ask is, how is it possible for believers to engage in sanctification? Well, that means to pursue holiness in our daily lives. How is it possible for believers to pursue holiness? The answer is found in verse two. For verse 2 says, because we are dead to sin. This is part of a rhetorical question. For the full question reads here that, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Well, the expected answer then would be, we that are dead to sin shall no longer live therein, meaning that believers shall no longer live in sin because they are dead to sin. To sin. This was actually a response to an even earlier question, which can be found in verse 1, which states that, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, there was a misconception that sinning will bring about a deeper experience of grace, which was flatly rejected by Paul in verse 2 on the basis that believers are dead to sin. According to Professor John Murray, date to sin suggests a state of being, whereas what the Apostle Paul had 
in mind or had in view was a definitive act. The once for all definitive breach with sin, which constitutes the identity of the believer. Hence, believers are best described as persons that died to sin, well, instead of persons that are dead to sin. Well, this is their identity, a special identity that belongs to the followers of Christ alone, to no one else but to them. This means that the old relationship between believers and sin has been broken. And as a result, believers have made a clean cut with sin. This was re-emphasized in verse 7, which states that he that is dead is freed from sin. Believers' decisive breach with the ring power of sin is like the kind of dismissal which a judge gives when an accused is justified. So sin has no further claim upon the person who is thus vindicated. Therefore, because we have died to sin, we can pursue sanctification. We can grow in holiness, well, which is the goal of pursuing it in the first place. Nevertheless, we ought to dig deeper and ask this next question. How did the believer die to sin? The answer lies in verse 3. It's through our baptism into the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3 states, Know ye not that so many of us as we baptize into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Paul makes it clear that everyone who has been baptized into our Lord Jesus Christ has also been baptized into his death. Well, there are no exceptions. To be baptized into Jesus Christ signifies believers' union with Christ. Because of this union, we are also united with him in everything that he had gone through. So both in his death, as well as thereafter in his resurrection. This is confirmed for us in verse 4, which states, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also sure should walk in newness of life. As we look further down to verse 10, we are told that in Christ's death, he died to sin once. Because Christ died to sin. Therefore, all believers were in union with him and have partaken in his death. We have also died to sin. Thus, Paul's focus on believers' union with Christ in his death, which is our baptism into his death, demonstrates, first of all, the reality that believers have died to sin. And secondly, it provides a foundation for our union with Christ in his resurrection, which we shall examine slightly later. Now we shall move on to the next logical question then. What then is the outcome for believers now that they have died to sin? Or, what is the relationship between believers and sin henceforth? Verses seven, 6 to 7 makes it clear that we are no longer enslaved to sin and have been set free from it because we have died to it. Well, dear believers, prior to our coming to faith in Christ, our Lord, we were slaves to sin, voluntarily serving it as our master, Though sin was a tyrant, we were not forced to serve it, but we did so willingly. For example, we see in the Bible how Judas gladly betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Well, he wasn't forced on it, but he gladly sinned in that manner. Yet upon coming to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, Sin instantly lost its grip over us. 
It was forced to give up its hold over us because we have been saved from its slavery. In other words, we were enslaved to it and we were released from being slaves to it from that point onwards. So it has no hold over us anymore. This was made possible because, verse 6 tells us that, our old man or our old self is crucified with Christ. Our old self or old man is a reference to the unregenerate man in his entirety in contrast with the new man as a regenerate man in his entirety. Professor Murray insightfully notes that it is a mistake to think that the believer is both an old man and a new man, or as having both the old and new man in him, as if he has a new man because of regeneration, and he had the old man because of remaining corruption. Well, he pointed out that this is not true because the old man has already been crucified with Christ. And it was a once-for-all definitive act after the pattern of Christ's crucifixion. In other words, just as our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified once, our old man has also been nailed to the cross. And this brings about the destruction of the body of sin, which you find in verse 6, thereby freeing us from servitude to sin. However, this does not mean that believers will not sin or they cannot sin anymore. We know that it can't be this because that would be contrary to our daily experience. Rather, a believer cannot live in sin anymore like how he used to live before he came to trust in Christ as his Lord and Saviour. Where sin was his master, where he was enslaved and gladly do his master's bidding. The Scottish theologian, Samuel Rutherford, provides an insightful illustration on this issue. Quote, then as it is one thing to sin and another thing to serve sin, so mortification, so acts of mortification must be in abstaining from greedy sin as hired servants make it their life and work to sin, and in remiss and wicked acts of sin as a dying man's operation are less intended and heightened than of a strong man in vigour and health." Unquote. Here, Rutherford differentiates between sinning and serving sin, asserting that although believers continue to sin, they must not serve sin because they have already been freed from being slaves to sin. Formerly, believers served sin diligently, like hired servants serving their masters, doing everything their masters commanded them to. But now they must forsake their former ways. They must abstain from serving sin. Although believers will continue to sin, they ought to recognize that the last few desires of their hearts have been dealt a fatal blow, such that they are now like a dying man who is eventually overcome by, because of his weakened ability to resist that which attempts to overpower him and not be as a strong man who was bent on sinning. In other words, or rather in the words of the Heidelberg Catechism question 43, the answer there is states that the evil desires of the flesh no longer reigns in us. So this brings us to the next point of consideration concerning the basis for our sanctification. Namely, we can now walk in newness of life. Let's look back to verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that look as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. 
Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Well, as stated earlier, Paul's emphasis on believers' union with Christ, as exemplified by our partaking in his death, lays the foundation for our experience of his resurrection life. Because just as we have died with Christ, we shall surely be risen with him. For the believer, the newness of life is an inevitable outcome. To work in newness of life makes it clear that this new life in Christ is not something that we receive and hold on in a passive manner. Rather, it demands our active involvement. We can be sure that the newness of life refers to Christ's resurrection life when we compare verses 4 and 5. 5 verse 5 states, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall, also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So in verse 4, we see it's being stated that death plus newness of life. And in verse 5, we see death plus resurrection life. So this is what, this is what gives us assurance that when we talk about the newness of life, we're referring to resurrection life, which we share with Christ. So in verse 5, the, the phrase planted together, which has been used to express our union with Christ in his death and resurrection. In a strict sense, it means grown together. So the verse itself may be paraphrased as, if we have become grown together in the likeness of his death. Well, this points to the closeness of our relation to Christ in his death. This same closeness is also reflected in our relation to Christ in his resurrection, which guarantees our participation in his resurrection life. We are given the added assurance that just as Christ's resurrection is permanent and it cannot be rolled back, our newness of life is lasting and it cannot be undone. Thus, the death and resurrection of Christ are like two interlocking links in a chain. The former confirms the certainty of the latter. This is reaffirmed in verse 8, which states, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Moving on to verses 9 to 10, we are being told that knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Our Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead is a guarantee that he, had, he has vanquished the power of death, and this victory over death is, uh, is an irrevocable finality. Therefore, even though we may continue to sin daily, and we need to repent daily, yet the reality is that we have died to sin, and we have been raised with Christ. However, this does not mean that we are dying and rising with Christ again and again on a daily basis. Rather, we are gradually receiving the gracious benefits of having died and risen with Christ day by day. Hence, in verse 11, the Apostle Paul exhorts believers to consider themselves dead to sin and alive to to, and alive to God. Likewise, this is what the verse says, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here Paul is urging believers to consider and appreciate the facts which were already obtained by virtue of our union with Christ. Namely, we have died to sin. We now leave to God. Or in other words, 
walking in the newness of Christ's resurrection life. In other words, these facts about us, they hold true regardless of how we might be feeling on a particular day. Whether it was a plain sailing day for you or for me, or we are feeling down and out that day. The reality is we are dead to sin and alive to God such that we can say no to sin and to live to God's glory. And we are able to pursue and thereby grow in holiness. Therefore, through the Apostle Paul, God commands all believers to pursue sanctification, to strive for holiness, which is the second point of our sermon today that we are considering. We're now going to look at the command to pursue sanctification. And the first part we're going to look at under this subheading is, do not let sin reign in our mortal body. Well, verse 12 states, let not sin reign, therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the last thereof. Although the word resigned, uh, although the word reigned is used, it does not mean that sin continues to reign in believers. In the sense that sin is our master and we are its slaves. Well, this point has already been refuted. Paul makes this crystal clear in verse 14, when he says that for sin shall have no dominion, shall not have dominion over you. Nevertheless, there is a sense in which sin may be spoken of as reigning in believers. That is when we give in to our sinful desires and serve the lust or the passions in our hearts. But we parents, we parents know that it is wrong for us to shout at our children. Well, for God has commanded us to be gentle and show grace to, to our burns, to our children. But sometimes when children make us angry, what I mean by angry is really angry, we cave in and we raise our voices at them. We might even attempt to justify that we're doing it for their good. Though deep down inside we know that it was sinful anger boiling over. Sometimes we might find ourselves responding in like manner to our colleagues or even to classmates, to friends. Thus, Paul exhorts believers, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. This implies it is our duty to stop sin from reigning in us. It means to also to not obey our sinful desires. And two, sin will reign in us when we fear to gut and to fight against it. Well, this is a certainty that will happen if we fear to do our duty. So here, Paul is actually speaking of an active duty on believers' part, on our part, in this battle to stop sin from reigning in us. It's a duty that God has enabled us to perform because we have partaken in Christ's resurrection life. We are not called to do something which is beyond our capacity. So if someone were to say to the slave who has not been freed, do not behave as a slave, well, it is, in fact, mocking his enslavement. But to say the same thing to the slave who has been set free is the necessary appeal to put into effect the privileges and the rights of his liberation. Thus, through believers are exhorted to demonstrate the reality of their deliverance from the dominion of sin by saying no to sin, to fight against the sinful desires that continue to dwell in them and to gratify them no more. Nevertheless, 
Believers are not merely commanded to stop serving sin. They are also commanded to obey God and commit themselves wholly to Him. Which is our next focus about not, not to be instruments of unrighteousness, but to be instruments of righteousness. And we read this in verse 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Set before us is a responsibility to make an active choice to serve God in righteousness. Being determined to think and to act in accordance with God's word in our daily lives, especially in the face of temptation to sin. Borrowing from Calvin, John Calvin's illustration, we may imagine a soldier fully equipped and ready to go into warfare at the order of his general. Well, for most of us here, guys who have been through the NS, you know what it's like when you're supposed to stand up front you know, with, with, with a weapon, telling you where the enemy is coming from and where you're going to, you're going to engage at, right? So everybody's just, just going to look that side to try to you know, be vigilant that no one comes through without us knowing. So in such situations, the soldiers' gears and weapons would definitely be for the destruction of the enemies. And therefore, the rifle will always point towards the enemy front, waiting to take on any, any oncoming foes. Well, a believer ought to prepare in like manner in his fight against sin. It is his duty to use all that he has, the faculties of both mind and body, to fight on to death. We see an instance of this in the Pilgrim's Progress, a scene where Christian was engaged, with, was engaged in a fight with Apollyon. So, uh, and a little bit from the book itself, it tells us that then Apollyon broke out into a grievous rage, saying, I am an enemy to this prince. I hate his person, his laws, and people. I am come out on purpose to withstand you. And to this Christian replied, Apollyon, beware what you do, for I am in the king's highway, the way of holiness. Therefore take heed to yourself. To which Apollyon replied, Apollyon, he strutted quite over the whole breadth of the way and said, I am void of fear in this matter. Prepare yourself to die. For I swear by my infernal den that you shall go no further. Here will I spill your soul. In short, thereafter, they got into a fight. So, having fought Apollyon, Christian, he became badly injured. Now, moving back to the narrative, then Apollyon, espying his opportunity, began to gather up close to Christian and wrestling with him, gave him a dreadful fall, and with that, Christian's sword flew out of his hand. Then, said Apollyon, I am sure of you now. And with that, he had almost pressed him to death. So that Christian began to despair of life. But as God would have it, while Apollyon was fetching of his last blow, thereby to make a full end of this good man, Christian nimbly stretched out his hand for his sword and caught it, saying, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. And with that, he gave a deadly trust, which made him give back as one that had received his mortal wound. Christian, perceiving that, made at him again, saying, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And with that, Apollyon spread forth his dragon's wings and sped him away. The Christian for a season saw him no more. Christian fought 
the good fight, all the way to the end. Our Lord has called us on to the same duty today. But if the, a believer were to turn the weapons in his hands towards his own camp, he will be considered a traitor. Such as the resultant confusion would provide the foes an opportunity to attack the camp. Such is the believer who gives his mind, eyes, hands, and feet over to sin. That would be a turning of his back against his Lord. And to this, the believer must not. Therefore, believers are to present ourselves and our members to God for his service and promotion of righteousness. However, we do well to know that believers are to serve God, not out of a slavish fear, for example, a fear of punishment, or compulsion, but of thanksgiving in response to the sacrifice and death of Christ on the cross on our behalf. Our gratitude to God for giving us Christ ought to fuel our thanksgiving to Him who loves us more than we could ever love ourselves. Hence, the final part of the answer to Heidelberg Catechism Lord's Day, uh, question, Lord's Day 16, question 43 states that believers may now offer ourselves to Him as a sacrifice of thankfulness. Having confirmed the command to pursue sanctification, we shall now turn to the encouragement and help given us on to sanctification. So how may we be encouraged on to sanctification? Verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Believers are under the grace of God. This is the basis of our assurance that we are surely able to obey Paul's exhortations to believers that has been given to us in verses 12 and 13 to pursue sanctification and to grow in holiness. It is impossible for believers to be displaced from this state of being under God's grace. Hence, there is no expiry date on believers' capacity to pursue sanctification. Therefore, whenever we attend diligently to this duty, we can be sure that we will enjoy success throughout a whole lifetime. For failures comes only when we fear to attend unto it as we ought to. Well, dear beloved, isn't it a great encouragement from God that we are given this certainty in the pursuit of our sanctification without having to worry that when we need to do so, suddenly or somehow unknowingly, we lose the capacity to do it? Well, being under God's grace also gives us the assurance that sin shall not have dominion over us. His explanation lies in the next clause, for ye are not under the law. Being under the law implies that the person is a slave to sin. First, not being under the law means that the person has been freed from servitude to sin. So to those among us who have yet to believe in Christ, the scriptures say that you continue to be under servitude to sin, enslaved by sin. Putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way whereby you may die to sin and be freed from its slavery. And the Lord Jesus has graciously promised that all who puts their trust in Him shall be saved. 
And thus I urge you, do not tarry any more in coming to know him. Do all that is within your means to know him more. Give your time to come to hear and to learn more about him as you would a most important pursuit in life. May you come to know and trust in him soon. To all who have been freed from sin's slavery, take heart that it cannot be undone because sin's power has been broken once and for all by Christ's sacrifice and death on the cross. Therefore, believers ought to attend diligently and joyfully to the duty of sanctification. However, this duty, it cannot be fulfilled if we were to undertake it on our own. For God has ordained the pursuit of sanctification as a duty needing the help of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. So in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 17 states that, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. In verse 17, Paul expounds that the desires of the flesh and those of the spirit are against one another, such that whenever believers gratify their sinful desires, the sinful desires of their flesh, they will struggle to serve God in righteousness. Hence, in the preceding verse, which is verse 16, Paul exhorts believers to walk in the Spirit. For when they do so, they would not gratify the desires of the flesh. This means submitting to the Holy Spirit's directions in our life, which certainly accords with the revealed Word. This Holy Spirit will sustain our regenerate desires and purposes, thereby strengthening our resolve to obey God in thoughts and deeds, granting us victory in the face of mounting temptations. Elsewhere in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, Paul makes clear that if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, he shall live. Hence, through the help of the Holy Spirit, we may fight and put to death the sinful desires of our flesh and grow in holiness. This is not merely a hopefulness. This is a certainty. This is a sure outcome. Therefore, beloved, we are never left on our own to engage in the duty of sanctification. This is a Christian duty that God has commanded us onto, which He has also given us the capacity to undertake, as well as the help of the Holy Spirit there onto, for His glory and for our, our ultimate good. So then, let us come before our Lord daily to seek grace afresh to engage diligently in the Christian duty of sanctification. Let's come before our, our Lord again in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, this duty of sanctification which you have given unto us, which you have commanded us unto, you do not merely command and leave us on our own to deal with it. We see how you have, by your grace, brought us to be united to Christ, to bring us to die to sin and to live to yourself. To have shown us the basis by which we have been enabled to engage in sanctification. And to have given us encouragement to know that, Lord, when we obey you,
we will surely succeed in fighting against sin and putting it to death. Oh Lord, but we pray for ourselves, for what weak people we are, for our eyes easily turn away from, ourself, from, from you onto ourselves and even onto the, our surrounding situation and circumstances. Such that, Lord, we allow ourselves in the face of temptations at times to tread around it, not realising or many a times failing to realise the danger that we place ourselves in. And Lord, help us to remember, Lord, this is a duty that you have commanded us on to, that therefore from temptation we shall flee, that we know that by your grace, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we shall succeed. And we thank you for all this. Help us, Lord, we pray that throughout this new week, to have this duty that you have commanded us at the forefront of our mind, and to come daily before you asking for great grace, Grace afreshed, that Lord grant it unto us, that we may glorify you, that we may honor you day by day. And for all this we pray for Christ's sake. Amen.